good evening colleagues i am dr arvin on behalf of the organizing team i would like to welcome each one of you for today's academic session on curative options for sickle cell disease on behalf of mcure pharma we are grateful for dr mb agarwal sir for his relentless guidance to put together high quality medical educations program dr mb agarwal sir doesn't need any introduction he is the professor and head of department of hematology at bombay hospital institute of medical sciences mumbai he is the consultant hematologist at leelawati hospital bridge candy hospital mumbai he is the president of mumbai hematology group and he has been the past president of indian society of hematology and blood transfusion and he is a gem of a person so without a further ado now i hand over uh, the meeting proceeding to dr mb agarwal sir thank you so much sir and over to you thank you dr arvin vilas i'll just share my screen so good evening to one and all today our guest speaker is dr gaurav kharia from delhi he is clinical lead apollo center for bone marrow transplantation and cellular therapy senior consultant pediatric hematology oncology and immunology at indraprastha apollo hospital new delhi he will be lecturing on curative options for sickle cell disease this webinar is brought to you by mumbai hematology group it is supported by mq and managed by my ideas i thank mr kayur soni manisha sonavadekar dr arvind vilas and the team mq for supporting our academic activity rajesh sharma kalpesh pampar and the team my ideas for managing all these webinars executive committee of mumbai hematology group our guest speaker dr gaurav kharia from delhi all our discussants were themselves eminent hematologists or stem cell transplanters the you participants for sparing your saturday evening tomorrow morning at 11:30 we have the next webinar where professor chandrakala from mumbai will be speaking on the journey of hemophilia towards cure discussants this evening include our colleagues from nagpur ludhiana bhubaneswar mangaluru bangalore belgavi gurgaon mumbai and lucknow to introduce them we have dr dipti jain the former professor and head department of pediatrics government medical college nagpur dr shruti kakka associate professor department of pediatrics in charge pediatric hematology and oncology at dayanand medical college and hospital ludhiana dr priyanka saman professor and head department of clinical hematology hemato oncology and stem cell transplantation at ims and some hospital bhubaneswar professor dr saroj panda is pediatric oncologist and hematologist sum hospital bhubaneswar odisha dr harsha prasad is consultant pediatric hematologist and oncologist assistant professor department of pediatrics kasturba medical college hospital manipal university mangaluru dr intezar mehndi director and head department of pediatric hematology oncology and bone marrow transplantation at scg hospital bangalore dr abhilasha sampagar she is pediatric hematologist oncologist at kle hospital belgaon the associate professor division of pediatric hematology oncology department of pediatrics at jawaharlal nehru medical college belgaon dr satya prakash yadav is director pediatric hematology oncology and bone marrow transplantation medanta the medicity gurgaon haryana dr preeti mehta she is pediatric hematologist oncologist at sir h n reliance foundation hospital safi hospital raheja hospital holy family hospital mumbai <coughs> dr prashant hirwarkar is consultant pediatric hematologist oncologist bmt specialist at bai jarbai wadia hospital for children mumbai dr ruchira misra she senior consultant pediatric hematology oncology pmt unit at srcc children hospital mumbai managed by narayana health dr amit jain fellow pediatric hematology oncology <laughs> consultant mcgm comprehensive thalassemia care 
pediatric hematology oncology in bmt center mumbai and lastly dr avanish shukla king king george's medical university lucknow before i invite the speaker to give his talk i like to introduce the jaslok hospital mumbai as against the treatment and cure of sickle cell disease there is department of pre implantation genetic testing for sickle cell disease and this is managed by dr prochi madan and dr firoza parikh so this technology has become an extremely important tool to prevent the birth of sickle cell disease and not so widely available in the country and hence this information could be vital and now it's my pleasure to invite dr gaurav khadia from delhi to speak to us on this subject of how do i manage i'm so sorry uh, the sickle cell disease cure okay thank you but over over to you. yes a second sir yeah yeah uh so uh is my screen visible to everyone yes you can just make it full screen just a second sir so uh thank you uh, uh sir for for uh, art in slide show mode yeah now now it's okay yeah so thank you very much sir for for uh, having me here on this forum today and it has been a pleasure real pleasure in the past as well to be a part of all these academic activities which uh, are being conducted by my uh, uh, mhg and uh, today it's a pleasure as well as an honor uh, to be here uh, some time back when sir asked me to uh, talk about uh, the sickle cell disease which was around 4 5 months back i would i thought it would be a great opportunity to to uh, interact with our colleagues and and discuss what we have been doing with respect to the curative options in sickle cell disease uh, since the time i came back from uk and started working here in india <clears throat> so uh, today uh, we shall be discussing more about uh, the curative options for sickle cell disease and as we all know it's uh, christmas today so so hope you all have a fun filled evening uh, so with respect to the presentation i don't know it will be fun filled or not but i'll try to make it as interesting as possible so the topic allocated uh, uh, for the discussion today is the curative options for sickle cell disease and i have added this uh, 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 these two words like 2022 and beyond because i mean i personally feel that this is we are at the cusp of a, a, a major revolution which is going to happen in next 5 years now before we move ahead uh, i would like to share this very uh, uh, nice quote uh, by marcus aurelius who was who was a roman uh, emperor uh, uh, who ruled between 180 to 250 uh, ad uh, which states that nothing has such a power to broaden the mind as the ability to investigate systematically and truly all that comes under thy observation in life and i think we as clinicians uh, live to this particular saying each day and we learn from each experience we have each patient we treat a brief overview of today's presentation so so we will dwell into the history of uh, sickle cell disease then uh, a quick look at the epidemiology and what is what is the expected uh, uh, incidence and prevalence of sickle cell disease worldwide pathophysiology current therapeutic modalities hematopoietic stem cell transplant background challenges and current update our experience of hscd for sickle cell disease the evolution of a full protocol 100 transplants for sickle cell disease what lessons we have learned uh, and why uh, uh, we need to look beyond hscd and the need of gene manipulating strategies a quick word about gene therapy versus gene editing and finally we'll sum up the discussion and and go on to the question answer session so <coughs> uh as we talk about sickle cell disease we know that it's a disease which is not too old i mean the, the uh, understanding of sickle cell disease uh, uh, started um, in 1910 when dr james hendrick who was a uh, physician practicing in chicago noticed in one of his patients that uh, 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 who presented to him with anemia and severe jaundice while examining his peripheral smear he noticed quite abnormal forms of uh, uh, red cells 
So he thought that it might be just a, a wrongly prepared uh, peripheral smear and he repeated the smear multiple times and he got the same findings to which he commented that uh, uh, this is the first time these weird findings have been reported as far as as far as per his knowledge and uh, he was not very sure at that point of time whether it is because of some chemical reaction or some drug which the patient has taken or it is a part or it is a pathognomonic of a new disease uh, related to uh, 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 red cell disorders so that was the beginning of the understanding of of uh, sickle cell disease in 1910 and here we stand in 2021 talking about gene therapy and gene editing for sickle cell disease subsequently in 1955 uh linus pauling i think all of us know him so he was a famous uh, uh, chemical biologist uh, in 1955 he described this molecular nature of sickle cell disease and it was it was a revolutionary finding which went on to get published in research in 1956 uh in the same year uh, dr v m ingram uh, uh very nicely demonstrated the difference uh between the various globins uh, 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 with respect to the sickle cell hemoglobin so what was the difference between the normal hemoglobin and the sickle cell hemoglobin while all this interest in sickle cell disease was uh, uh, happening uh, a pediatrician a lady pediatrician working with the uh, us armed forces uh, uh, at that point of time posted in brooklyn new york she noticed uh, a very uh, nice and interesting thing that the significance of the paucity of sickle cell in newborn negro infants so she noticed that the newborns uh, born to uh, ladies with sickle cell disease uh, so these newborns were uh, partially protected against the veno vaso occlusive crisis or the typical manifestations of sickle cell disease and uh, she attributed it to Uh, uh the presence of uh, uh, uh hemoglobin or this uh, hpf uh, so that was his, her speculation which was later uh, uh, uh published in 1994 uh, by uh, by platt and uh, martin steinberg in in nhgm in 1994 and they highlighted the importance of fetal hemoglobin in sickle cell disease and it was very clearly illustrated that the patients who have hpf level more than 8.6 are partially protected against the symptoms of sickle cell disease as compared to the patients who have a hemoglobin f of 8. less than 8.6% <clears throat> now uh if i may be allowed to ask uh, uh the audience i don't know uh, i can ask the audience or not but uh, anyone who knows this particular gentleman uh am i allowed to Kal kalpesh uh, are you managing it okay so uh, uh the the person in picture here is is a very famous uh, clinician scientist working in boston children's hospital so his name is uh, dr vijay ji sankaran and uh, uh uh it's a shame that uh, uh we and other parts other other people other hematologists in the world know know very little about it but his contribution to uh the hemoglobin disorders is is immense and he was the one who clearly demonstrated or very nicely illustrated the switch from fetal hemoglobin to adult hemoglobin and he published his findings uh, uh, in in 2010 where he very nicely demonstrated how this switch of fetal hemoglobin from the embryonic to fetal and especially from fetal hemoglobin to the adult hemoglobin takes and he also highlighted the importance of bcl11a uh, uh, as as a repressor and how this particular target can be used uh for the induction of fetal hemoglobin and as we all know this is the major area of interest in the recent studies whether it is gene therapy or gene editing so bcl 11a is the is the main area of interest uh for all these uh, gene manipulating strategies now looking briefly about the epidemiology of the disease we know that uh, sickle cell disease is prevalent in in dif in different parts of the world and the parts of the world it is prevalent there is also endemicity of uh, uh, malaria 
And this was a very nice article published in Nature Communication in 2020 by Peel, David Vedral, and, and other uh, colleagues, which very nicely illustrated the incidence of uh, malaria in various parts of the world and the relative uh, frequencies or incidence of uh, HPS in those particular regions. Uh, subsequently, in 2013, the same group published uh, this particular uh, uh, paper. It was a very important and a path-breaking paper, which made uh, a lot of policy makers to realize that this is the time to act. And this paper highlighted the global burden of sickle cell anemia in children under five uh, between 2010 and 2050. So how is it going to be in 2050 and subsequently? And this modeling was based on the demographics, excess mortality, and the intervention. So, so David Vedral, as we all know, so they have a significant country, he has a significant contribution to the understanding of sickle cell disease. And as we can see in this cartogram, uh, this is the percentage or the relative distribution of uh, uh, newborns with sickle cell disease across the globe. So we can see that these blue or uh, 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 light blue areas, uh, the incidence is pretty low and it is the highest in these areas in red. And if we look at this same cartogram uh, 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 in 2050, then it very clearly illustrates that the burden of the disease is going to increase across the globe. So. Uh, the way we stand today, there is no uh, reason to think that the sickle cell disease burden will decrease in years to come. So it, if, if this is the uh, frequency uh, at which it grows, this will be a huge burden in 2050. And it will, if, if we start acting now, then uh, it will be only by around 2060 or 2070 that it will start plateauing down. A uh, quick look at the pathophysiology of the disease. So we know that it's it's a monogenic disorder, and uh, uh, the the <coughs> the defect or uh, the change which happens is is between this uh, adenine to thymine, so A to T change, which leads to this is at the mRNA level, which leads to uh, a change from glutamine to valine at the protein level. And subsequently, this change in the protein level leads to uh, a particular uh, vulnerability of these hemoglobins where they are prone to polymerization when they are exposed to the oxygenated states. And we know that once this polymerization happens, there is the formation of the shape of red blood cells, they turn into sickle cells. And we all know that uh, subsequently what happens, the two main uh, 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 pathology or uh, pathophysiology which happens subsequently is the hemolysis and the effects due to hemolysis and due to the obstruction and the persistent damage which happens to the uh, endothelium uh, by these repeated episodes of hemolysis and uh, vasoclusive crisis. So there are myriad of manifestations. In short, there's not even a single organ in the body which, which remains unaffected. However, the disease, the clinical presentation is quite variable. Some kids, some patients have different manifestations, some have different manifestations. So it's quite a variable disease, but in short, uh, 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 no organ remains untouched with sickle cell disease. So what are the current therapies uh, available for sickle cell disease? So <clears throat> as far as the supportive care is concerned, penicillin, we all know it was a path breaking discovery and it is because of that penicillin that uh, the uh, longevity uh, has increased by almost two decades in different parts of the world, including the African continent, Middle East and, and in Asia as well. Vaccination has added, uh, 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 has also added a significant contribution and in RJ6, so the supportive care has improved significantly. Uh, patients need chronic transfusion whenever required, uh, and subsequently, uh, they need iron chelation as well. Hydroxyurea, we all know the importance of hydroxyurea in sickle cell disease, and there are multiple mechanisms of hydroxyurea work. So it's an extremely, extremely important drug in any child who is diagnosed with sickle cell disease and is symptomatic should be uh, on hydroxyurea. Uh, the earlier stage at which the hydroxyurea can be initiated has also been very clearly demonstrated that the uh, at around six months of age, if the patient is symptomatic, then hydroxyurea can be initiated. And there are some other new drugs such as Voxeltor uh, Voxel or uh, Crisanolizumab, <coughs> which have also shown significant improvement as far as supportive care is concerned. 
But when we talk about the curative modalities, uh, as we await more and more supporting evidence of gene therapy and gene editing, myeloablative or reduced intensity conditionings, allogenic stem cell transplant is the only way to offer a cure for sickle cell disease uh, as of uh, today. So <clears throat> moving on to hematopoietic stem cell transplant for sickle cell disease, I'll not dwell into the other modalities uh, uh, of fetal induction. Uh, uh, because our topic of discussion today is specifically the curative modalities for sickle cell disease. So we directly move on to the transplants for sickle cell disease. So how it all started. The first report of uh, uh, a cure for sickle cell disease was published in 1996 in NEGM. And it was an incidental finding where a patient, a young lady suffering from acute myeloid leukemia, who underwent transplant, a sibling donor transplant for acute myeloid leukemia, was found to be cured of uh, sickle cell disease as well subsequently. So this was, this was, <clears throat> this was the beginning of, of uh, this thought of uh, treating uh, uh, sickle cell disease uh, uh, by offering a bone marrow transplant. Uh, subsequently, if we look at the overall literature uh, or the number of transplants done globally, then this is the ABMT Eurocot uh, CIBMTR data, combined data till 2013. I'm sorry, I could not get the combined data of uh, both uh, EBMT and uh, uh, CIBMTR, uh, 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 I mean, off late, but this is the data till 2013 where we can see that close to around 1,200 transplants were offered for sickle cell disease including various donor types, whether it was actually identical donor or a cord blood donor or an unrelated or a heteroidental family donor. So we can see that this, the, the, uh, uh, this is in stark contrast to the overall number of transplants done <coughs> globally. So we very clearly, it is, it, is, it is now understood that HSCT in sickle cell disease in a, is an unmet need. Why? Uh, it is because more than 140,000 patients with sickle cell disease in Europe and USA and more in emerging countries. So this is just the number in Europe and America. And if we talk about other parts of the world, the number is huge. Approximately 40,000 patients had indications and HLA identical donor for, uh, for sickle cell disease in, in Europe and USA, but they could not be transplanted because of one or other uh, uh, reasons. If we include the African continent, the Middle East, and the India to this number, then this number of patients who are suffering from sickle cell disease is huge. And we, as we have all, uh, already seen in the previous uh, uh, cartogram by, by David Bedral in 2000, published in PLOS in 2013, that the number is going to increase till 2050 or 2060, even if we start acting now. So <clears throat> it is definitely an unmet need, and, and uh, we need to take up this challenge now. So current status globally. So each year we know that approximately 100,000 transplants are done across the globe and the numbers are increasing every year. Amidst this only 1,200 transplants till 2013. And by now, if we put all together, so if I combine the data of uh, 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 ASTCT and uh, EBMT and put it together, then approximately 2,300 transplants have been done for sickle cell disease so far, starting, uh, I mean, including all past four to five decades since, since transplant uh, uh, became a, a therapeutic modality for various uh, red cell disorders. So why this difference? What are the factors responsible for these or what are the obstacles in offering transplant for sickle cell disease patients? So as far as my understanding is, after working in uh, sickle cell disease community for almost uh, seven to eight years, or maybe a decade now, so the lack of clear-cut indications for transplant. So there were various indications. So the first uh, set of indications, which was proposed somewhere in 20, uh, 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 2001, 2002, then subsequently other modifications were done. So there is still not uh, no clear-cut uh, idea about what are the indications for transplant. Then lack of awareness, information even amongst the physicians about the success of transplant, the parents and the patients. Lack of funds, obviously, this becomes a very important factor in our part of the country, uh, our part of the world. Uh, lack of availability of suitable donors. So we'll see how why it is important with respect to sickle cell disease. So these are the <coughs> sorry major obstacles or challenges which I feel is a limiting factor in in uh, uh, transplants for sickle cell disease. Now uh, uh, moving to the first part of this. 
uh, what are the indications so so this is the most inclusive kind of uh, indications for transplant which was which was proposed by uh, bolinos mede and it was uh, used for selection of their haploidental family donor uh, transplant cohort and uh, this paper was published in blood and this is one of the uh, path breaking papers and uh, we all know uh, we all uh, consider this as as uh, uh, a stepping stone for making any further contribution to this field so if we go through these indications i mean uh, there will be very few patients who will not fulfill this particular these particular criteria so uh, 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 having said this uh, the bottom line is the number of patients who need transplant are significantly high we need to have a high index of suspicion and and pick them up early because the best results of transplants is is only in the first decade of life and we'll see it, we'll have a look about it in uh, the subsequent slides now <clears throat> looking at uh, uh, the outcomes of various consortiums uh, working in the sickle cell disease so this was a meta analysis published by uh, the american consortium which looked at the effect of donor type conditioning regimen intensity on allogeneic transplantation outcomes in patients with sickle cell disease and it was a retrospective multi centric analysis and it was across 90 centers which were primarily offering transplant for sickle cell disease so this was their cell selection algorithm so they picked up 1400 uh, patients who underwent transplant <coughs> till 2017 so 421 were uh, excluded because of one or other reason and then another 86 were included so almost 910 patients were included in their analysis and the primary the most important findings in their particular analysis was that <clears throat> the outcomes of actually identical donors uh, was close to 90% in in, in uh, uh, across all the centers but what was differing what was significantly compromised was alternative donor transplant outcomes so if we look at unrelated donor or the haploidental donor so these were uh, not great and they were uh, close to around 50 60 or somewhere 70% uh, when it comes to alternative donor transplant so the graft failure rates were high so we can see whether it was unrelated donor or haploidental donor the graft failure rates were significantly high and the overall survival although overall survival was close to 85 80 85% but the event free survival as we saw earlier it was not great we can also see a uh, sharp drop in the uh, 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 event free survival of uh, haploidental patients close to 2 years and this was because of a study which was done for sickle cell disease which was just a serotherapy based study i'm sure a number of my colleagues uh, who who are into transplant say they might have gone through this particular study which was mainly a campath and sorolimus based uh, uh, transplant so uh, they had initial good outcomes but subsequently when the sorolimus was was tapered there were number of graft failures which were noticed so possibly that was the reason why uh, this sharp drop was seen close to two years of follow up <clears throat> then looking uh, uh, towards uh, the european side our european colleagues so this was a paper published in 2020 in hemato oncology in stem cell transplant <coughs> stem cell therapies therapies by elin glukman selim and other colleagues so they looked at the alternative donor transplant so they included 144 patients in their analysis 70 were unrelated donor six were cord blood transplants and 68 were haploidental family donor transplants now if you look at the overall survival three year overall survival it was close to around 86% but if we look at the event free survival it was around 72% and this was of the entire cohort and if we uh, thread it uh, further then the outcomes for unrelated donors were around close to close to around 78 to 80% haploidental donor transplants were around 66% event free survival so uh, <clears throat> this unrelated donor transplant or haploidental transplant still remains a challenge and the results need to be optimized further uh looking at another paper uh, uh by by the american colleague sushal nishnoy so she has also she she also has a significant contribution in the field of transplants for sickle cell disease so they did a trial of unrelated donor marrow transplantation for children with sickle cell disease and uh, if we just look at their outcomes so the event free survival at one year was 75.9% and at two years was 68.6% and the overall survival was 86 and 
So this just highlights that whenever <laughs> it's alternative donor transplants, so there's no confusion about the mad sibling donor transplants. The outcomes are phenomenal, very good. Majority of centers are touching close to 90 or beyond 90%. But when it comes to alternative donor transplants, unrelated or haploidentical, these are the areas where, <coughs> where we still need to work hard because the outcomes are not uh, somewhere between 65 to 75%. <coughs> So, excuse me. So, haploidentical uh, donor hematopoietic stem cell transplants for sickle cell disease. And as we talk more about it, uh, I highlighted the indications of uh, used in this particular paper. So, this was a landmark paper which a number of us use, use uh, uh, for our guidance as we plan our strategies further. So, in this paper, <clears throat> they use the John Hopkins approach for, for uh, haploidentical transplants in sickle cell disease. So they recruited 17 patients, out of which 14 were haploidentical and three were matched sibling donor. So <clears throat> this was the strategy which they used. So uh, typical flu site, TPI, along with PTCY, tacrolimus, and MMF uh, uh, for GVHD profile access. So the outcomes were great because uh, this was a cohort of patients which were doing very peer poorly, which were not having any sibling or unrelated donor. And if they were not offered a haploidentical transplant, they would have died. So <clears throat> out of the 17 patients, and if we leave aside the 13, uh, three patients who were mad sibling donor, out of 14 patients, uh, the overall survival was 100%. But the challenge was that the failure-free survival was poor, and the 43% and 43 of the haploidentical uh, patients rejected their graft at some point of time. So all the results were not great, but this was an indication that haploidentical family donor transplants can be considered as a therapeutic modality for patients who are suffering from this particular disease and do not have a HLA identical sibling donor. <clears throat> so coming towards uh, uh, our journey of uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplants for sickle cell disease. So the first patient which uh, I transplanted after coming back uh, from UK was, was in April uh, <clears throat> 2014. And this was a mad sibling donor transplant, five-year-old boy, African descent, <clears throat> quite symptomatic. And this was one of the most challenging transplants because this child had uh, acute chest syndrome in the middle of the transplant and the entire transplant happened uh, 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 on a non-invasive ventilation. And fortunately, this child is doing well. And we, as we know, as we can see that he's six year post bone marrow transplant doing extremely well in life. Uh, the same year, uh, we got this opportunity to do our first haploidentical transplant for sickle cell disease. And this was again an uh, uh, African child, three year old, uh, we use the same strategy which I was using in UK and this child is also did pretty well and uh, he's also <coughs> six years post bone marrow transplant doing extremely well clinically. <coughs> so coming to haploidentical family donor transplants for sickle cell disease our experience so far. So uh, I started doing my transplants with this particular approach. So when I was working in UK at Imperial College uh, under the mentorship of uh, uh, Josu, uh, the same year when I joined uh, or a year earlier, uh, Bolonos published a paper which I showed uh, some time back. So the main problem in that paper was the rejection rate, so 43% rejection rate. So Josu highlighted, Josu made some modifications and uh, added this hypertransfusion, hydroxycarbamide and azathioprine as a pre-transplant preparation uh, to the backbone of uh, 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 John Hopkins protocol. And he also added thiotapa. So the pre-transplant preparation along with the intensification of the conditioning. And with this, the outcomes were fairly good and the rejection rates went down from 43% to less than 20%. So this was uh, uh, this was my beginning of transplants, haploidentical transplants for sickle cell disease. I'll, I'll primarily be talking about haploidentical transplants because for sibling donor transplants, the outcomes are, are excellent everywhere uh, across different parts of the world, different centers in our country as well. So <clears throat> the first modification with respect to haploidentical transplants for sickle cell disease at our center, uh, the pre-transplant preparation, uh, we started uh, uh, the pre-transplant preparation from day minus 60, which included hydroxyurea, azathioprine, and hypertransfusion, the same strategy which we are following at uh, St. Mary's. The conditioning included flu site, TBI, thiotapa, thymoglobulin, uh, same as John Hopkins protocol, 
and the PTCY tetrolimus MMF was used as uh, uh, GVHD profile excess. So of the initial eight patients who underwent transplant, three had graft failure. One was a primary and two secondary graft failure, despite an optimal dose of uh, CD34 cells and the DSA negativity. Okay, So <clears throat> what we uh, noticed was that the we still have challenges of rejection in graft versus host disease. And, we noticed that uh, the cohort of the patients which we were getting primarily, majority of them were uh, of African descent. And we realized that uh, the patients <clears throat> which we were getting were very different from patients who were being treated at uh, 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 Imperial College when I was doing my training there. So this was the background uh, basis of our second modification. And the, uh, uh, and the basis, uh, our second modification was based on these two particular studies. Uh, by Anuradhapan et al. So we know about this uh, landmark paper by Anuradhapan uh, from the Suradej Hongyang group, which, where they highlighted the importance of pre-transplant preparation by using fludarabine and uh, dexamethasone as pre-transplant preparation for patients with haploidentical transplants for thalassemia major, transfusion-dependent thalassemia. So we thought that the same strategy can be used in sickle cell disease. And similarly, uh, Anna B. Pauloska again used the same strategy in a small number of patients, four patients with sickle cell disease and showed excellent results. So we decided to incorporate the same in our patients, maintaining the same conditioning chemotherapy and the same GVHD uh, and a little bit alteration in the GVHD profile. So, so what we did was we added two cycles of uh, <coughs> fludex along with the azathioprine, hydroxyurea and uh, hypertransfusion. Conditioning remained the same, GVHD profile excess, PTY, PTCY, tacrolimus, and MMF. So out of the 16 patients whom we treated with this particular approach, uh, we had two graft failures, one primary, one secondary, and two had acute uh, graft versus host disease, uh, grade two to four, and four had chronic uh, GVHD, all limited. So <clears throat> and there were some associated problems with calcineurin inhibitors, tacrolimus, which we were using in this protocol. So this uh, made us understand that, yes, we are getting there, but graft failure still remains a challenge and we need to address it further along with graft versus host disease and some other problems of calcineurin inhibitors. So <clears throat> the third modifications which we made, the aims were to minimize the rejection. And for this, we emphasize more on the pre-transplant preparation to minimize graft versus host disease. So here we added upfront rexifer for mobilization, and I'll see what was the basis behind this. And uh, the overall uh, uh, objective was to improve the overall survival and the event-free survival. Now, <clears throat> so the background of our third modification was based on the experience of Bhatt. So uh, uh, Sunil, our, our colleague uh, practicing in, at Narayana. So he, um, he uh, published his uh, initial cohort of patients where he used, where he intensified the pre-PTIs further by adding cyclophosphamide in a cohort of uh, uh, haploidentical transplants for thalassemia, transfusion dependent thalassemia, and uh, showed very good results. So we thought that probably uh, if we intensify the PTIs further, we might be able to decrease the GVHD as well as the rejections further. And the <clears throat> decision to add prolexifer was based on this publication by Sergio Rotella at will. And the hypothesis was this, that by using this strategy, we could um, help in engraftment without significantly increasing the risk of GVHD. And if you go through the paper, there's a very interesting paper which highlights how Plerixifer can favorably modify the graft by which you can uh, <coughs> get a faster engraftment and decreased incidence of GVHD. And simultaneously, to get rid of the complications of uh, scalcinurin inhibitors, we changed from tacrolimus to serolimus as far as the GVHD profile excess was concerned. So uh, with all these modifications, we came up with this protocol, which was called as a polar protocol, which included two cycles of PTIS, along with hydro, uh, hydroxycarbamide, azathioprine, and hypertransfusion, starting from day minus 60. We took autologous backup for all our patients with a target CD34 of uh, 5 million cells per kg. Then the conditioning remained the same. <clears throat> Mobilization was with GCSF along with upfront plerexifer for all the patients and the GVHD profile excess was this PTCY, serolimus, and MMF. <clears throat> so we went on to publish uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the first 25 patients who were treated uh, uh, on this particular protocol in, in EBMT last year in 2020. Uh, 
So <clears throat> the patient characteristics of this particular study, the median age of 7.5 years range from 2 to 22 years, all had sickle related complications and were non-responsive to hydroxyurea. 21 had mother as donors, two father, two siblings, all were DSA negative with a cutoff MFI of uh, more than 2000. All patients received a dose of 10 million cells per kg. So that was the cutoff which we decided as <clears throat> in this particular protocol. And the median CD3 dose was 16.53 into 10 to the power 7 with a range of 10.44 to 41.9. <clears throat> so the median time to neutrophil and platelet engraftment, so pretty robust neutrophil and platelet engraftment of 13 million of 13 days for both in contrast to uh, our, our other colleagues in the Europe. So if I look at the uh, uh, collective data from, uh, from European studies, so their uh, median time to neutrophil engraftment was around 25 to 26 days. So we could definitely improve the engraftment by almost eight to 10 days, which becomes extremely, extremely important in our part of the world where each day of neutropenia brings a lot of morbidity and mortality to our patients undergoing transplants. <clears throat> So the complications post-transplants, haploanticle fever or cytokine release syndrome was seen in all the recipients uh, which settled post-cyclophosphamide in all bearing, uh, barring one which required tocilizumab uh, at day six. Perigraphment fever or engraftment syndrome, <coughs> engraftment fever was seen in 15 patients, that is 60% patients, whereas engraftment syndrome was seen in 28% patients, which was managed with methylprednisolone. However, three patients required tocilizumab. CMD, CMV reactivation was seen in 11 patients five patients uh, had it prior to the engraftment. So after PTIs, they had a CMV reactivation, which was treated uh, and uh, subsequently they were taken up for transplants. And PK-induced hemorrhagic cystitis was seen in three patients. <clears throat> Uh, acute GVHD, grade 2 to 4, acute GVHD was seen in 20% uh, of the patients. Uh, chronic GVHD was uh, seen in three had evidence of limited GVHD. Okay. Chimerism, all 22 alive patients had more than 95% donor chimerism at last follow up. And uh, if you look at the transplant outcome at a follow up of 485 days, which was in December at the time of uh, uh, <clears throat> publish, uh, uh, sending our results for publication, 22 patients uh, were alive uh, and disease-free, making an overall survival and disease-free survival of 88%. So the probability of GVHD-free survival and overall survival was fairly good. As I said, it was around, uh, uh, so chronic time to uh, acute GVHD, probability of acute and chronic GVHD was less than 20%, and the overall survival, as I highlighted, was around 88%. So moving on further, our overall experience of uh, uh, transplants for sickle cell disease so far. So we have recently pub, uh, uh, sent our publication for, <coughs> sent our uh, abstract for EBMT this year, uh, where we have uh, shared our experience of 100 hematopoietic stem cell transplants for sickle cell disease lessons learned. So uh, we included 100 consecutive patients who underwent sickle, uh, transplants for sickle cell disease between January, sorry, Jan, between April 2014 and October 2021. They were all enrolled in the study. So retrospective data collection, all patients met one or the laid down criteria for hematopoietic stem cell transplant. 44 patients underwent actually identical donor transplant, out of which 38 were matched sibling donor, four were matched related donor, <clears throat> one cord blood and one match generated donor transplant, whereas 56% underwent a haploantical family donor transplant. Uh, the conditioning and GVHD profile axis are as highlighted here. So for HLA identical cohort, uh, 30 patients received bucelfan based conditioning and another 14 received thiotipa based conditioning. For haploantical family, <coughs> haploantical family donors, 54 received uh, the typical John Hopkins and uh, two received other because of uh, uh, intolerance to flograbine, which they uh, which they had during the PTI escosis. So we modified the strategy uh, conditioning a little bit. Uh, with respect to GVHD profile access, HLA identical uh, donor transplants. So 36 patients received uh, cyclosporin-based GVHD profile access. Another eight received PTCY, zero plus MMF-based GVHD profile access. For haploidentical family donor, PTCY zero MMF was used in 45 and PTCY tacron MMF. 11 patients. <clears throat> so looking at the outcomes, so the median age was seven years, the range was nine months to 32 years. Uh, uh, 61 were males, 39 females. Graph failure was seen in uh, five, two primary, three secondary. Median time to neutrophil and platelet engraftment was 13 days with a range of six to 20 and eight to 48. The median follow-up of uh, uh, 1,064 days range fell to 
2,806 days, the overall survival in the disease Israel of the entire cohort was 83 and 79% respectively. The overall survival in HLA identical cohort was 88, uh, sorry, 89% approximately, with a mortality of around 11%. In haploidentical family donor, the overall survival was 78.57%, and the disease risk survival was 71.43%, and the rejection was around 9%, <clears throat> and the mortality was 21.43%. Although HLA identical donor transplants heard a little bit better, but this, this difference was not found uh, uh, to be significant statistically. In the haploidentical family donor, the overall survival was better with the Apollo protocol. That is the third modification which we made. It was, sorry, this is a little bit wrong. So it's around 84% with respect to 76%. And if we see these percentages, and if we compare with the paper published by uh, Eileen Gluckman in 2020, uh, uh, so we can see that the outcomes are, our outcomes are almost similar to the outcomes or a shade better than what was published in their particular uh, <coughs> paper. And if you look at the, at the third modification, the Apollo protocol views, definitely our outcomes are better as compared to the outcomes reported by the European colleagues. So the median time to neutrophil in platelet engraftment was 13 days as, as we saw earlier uh, for both of them. The overall survival and the rejection-free survival. So if we see the overall survival, uh, if you look at the probability, 91% patients had survival beyond 1100 days in the mad sibling donor group, and 74% had survival beyond 1100 days in the haploidentical family donor group. <clears throat> if, you look the, if you look at the rejection-free survival, uh, and if we censor the other causes of mortality, so the probability of survival was 100% rejection-free survival beyond 2,804 days in MSD group uh, or the match donor group, uh, which includes match sibling donor, match unrelated donor, uh, cord blood donor, and uh, yeah, match related donor. And 89% had rejection-free survival beyond 1,000 days in haploidentical family donor groups. <clears throat> So the overall survival and rate of rejection haploidentical family donors. So now we are talking about haploidentical family donors, and we are further segregating into Apollo protocol versus the uh, rest. So if you look at it, then definitely the uh, overall survival is better with the Apollo protocol. Although this significant, uh, this difference is not significant statistically so far. Uh, but if we look at the uh, rejection free survival, this difference is definitely significant and we have seen no rejections with the pro Apollo protocol, which we have been using uh, uh, currently. <clears throat> the interesting fact, and, and it is a known fact also, which, which was further uh, highlighted in our analysis as well, was the age at transplantation. So if the <clears throat> age at transplantation was less than 13 years versus more than 13 years, made a significant difference in the outcome and this was found to be statistically significant. Okay, so uh, here we can see that uh, uh, patients who underwent, in the overall cohort, uh, patients who underwent transplant less than 13 years of age had much better outcomes as compared to patients who underwent transplant at more than 13 years of age at the time of transplantation. If we further split it into match sibling and haploidentical donor group, then we can see that uh, if it is less than 13 years, in match sibling donor, 97% had survival beyond 2,800 days and 66% in less than, in more than 13 years of age group. And in haploidentical family donors, this was 85% uh, versus 61%. <clears throat> Now we further uh, thought of dividing our, our uh, group into 2000, before 2018 and after 2018. So we can see then actually identical donor, there was a paradoxical drop in, in the uh, uh, survival after 2018. And uh, this is probably because we had some late deaths uh, who were transplanted earlier before 2018, but unfortunately they died because of some or other complication like secondary malignancy or two patients with chronic GVHD after 2018. So that is why we can see a drop here. But if you look at the haploidentical family donor, the outcomes are definitely better after 2018. And this is because of the uh, improved understanding, better supportive care and better conditioning and uh, better uh, rejection-free survival. <coughs> So the overall survival and rate of rejection, this we have seen earlier also. So in uh, uh, Apollo protocol, it was better as compared to the previous uh, protocols which we're using for haploidentical family donors. And the rejection free survival was definitely uh, found to be statistically significant, different between the two protocols. 
So the summary of our learning. So HLA identical donor is the preferred source. There's no doubt about it. Success of haploidentical family donor uh, transplants is increasing day by day and is approaching close to HLA identical donor transplants. We have addressed the challenges of graft foliar to almost 100%. So uh, in past three years, we haven't seen a significant graft failure irrespective of the donor choice, whether it is a sibling donor or an unrelated donor or a haploidentical family donor. GVHD rates have also come down significantly to less than 5 to 10%, possibly by intensifying PTIS and by the use of plerexifer, where we get a preferential increase in the CD34 as compared to CD3 count. Uh, age, as uh, per our understanding, age plays a very significant role and it is the single most important predictor after the HLA typing. So less than 13 years versus more than 13 years at the time of transplantation decides significantly about the outcomes. Infection, especially viral, remains the next big challenge to address. And as we plan further, our fourth, am fourth amendment, which we are considering, uh, we are further trying to uh, segregate our cohort based on the age and reticular site count, where we are uh, <clears throat> dividing them into one cycle of PTIs versus two cycle of PTIs. And we are also looking at cutting down on serotherapy so that we can address the problem of uh, uh, viral infections, which is our major concern now. So if someone asks me that whom to transplant and when to transplant, uh, this is one nice quote by, I, I think it is it's, it is from one of the review by Shalini Shinoy, which states that as in all non-malignant disorder for best outcomes, transplant for sickle cell sh disease should be performed uh, when a recipient is at a good functional baseline in anticipation of the inevitable organ damage that is driven by the duration of pathology and thus by age. So, <clears throat> uh, uh, after looking or after discussing the hematopoietic stem cell transplant, which is the current standard of care for these patients, we also need to peep into the future, that what the, what the future holds or can we make things better for our patients who, who need uh, curative modalities for these particular diseases. <coughs> so why do we need anything beyond transplants? Now, even after all the advances in conditioning and the supportive care, still transplants are associated with high morbidity and mortality, uh, which we have seen in the analysis, previous analysis of, of uh, almost 100 patients now. Uh, the donor pool is limited because uh, we have, again, uh, very nicely documented that alternative donor transplants, although the outcomes are improving, but still it has a lot of challenges to be addressed. Age is a barrier. So uh, when we are dealing with patients beyond 13 years or 15 years of age, definitely offering transplants for them is, a, is not a great idea. And maybe autologous gene man manipulating strategies might be a better way to help them. Uh, there's risk of rejection, graft versus host disease and infection secondary to the immune suppression. So all these problems uh, remain with allogenic uh, stem cell transplants. And uh, apart from these uh, problems associated with transplant, sickle cell disease uh, being a monogenic, being a monogenic uh, mutation makes it interesting to, to target for autologous gene correction, that is gene therapy or gene editing. So just a second. So approaches to gene manipulation. So uh, these are, this is a, a, a pictorial which, which I have picked up from a uh, presentation by Farongal et al. in ASH 2020. So <clears throat> very, very nicely highlighted the, the process of, of uh, gene manipulation, whether it is gene therapy or gene editing for uh, 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 red cell disorder, whether, whether it is thalassemia or sickle cell disease. So as we can see, stage one, the patients are screened, the stem cells are collected, then they go to a central manufacturing process where the CD34s are isolated. They either undergo a lentiviral induced transduction or a CRISPR Cas9 based gene editing. And then the cells are frozen, they are returned to the facility, the patient undergoes a myeloblative conditioning, and then they receive either this gene editive product or a lentiviral uh, 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 transduced product. And subsequently, the patient waits for engraftment. Now, <clears throat> uh, the point which is uh, which which I want to highlight here is that this uh, CRISPR Cas9 this this is a non-viral vector mediated strategy where um, where uh, we use a mechanical method which is called as electroporation for the introduction of our gene of interest into the particular into particular 
cell and then it uh, goes and integrates with the DNA. So these are, this is a viral vector mediated and this is a non-viral viral vector uh, uh, electroporation mediated uh, gene editing. Now, before we discuss about gene therapy and uh, gene editing, uh, it is very important to know about the regulation of fetal hemoglobin because these, this, this helps us to, to identify a target of uh, gene manipulating strategies. So uh, <clears throat> as I briefly highlighted uh, earlier, uh, when I uh, mentioned uh, Vijay Shankaran uh, and his contribution to the uh, rose, role of uh, switch from fetal hemoglobin to adult hemoglobin, uh, we can see this, this uh, beta hemoglobin <coughs> cluster at, at chromosome 11. So there is a locus control region, as we know, and there is uh, hemoglobin E, then hemoglobin G1, G2, and there is hemoglobin B, HPB locus. So uh, in, in the process of uh, uh, development, this locus control region gets, uh, attaches itself to these particular uh, 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 loci and uh, helps in the formation of whether it's uh, fetal hemo, sorry, embryonic hemoglobin or fetal hemoglobin or the adult hemoglobin. Now, when the, this crucial switch happens from the fetal to hemoglo adult hemoglobin, this BCL11A plays a significant role as a repressor. Okay, so it prevents the locus control region from binding BCL uh, from binding to fetal hemoglobin H HBG locus and uh, diverts it towards the HBB locus so that the H fetal hemoglobin is not formed and the adult hemoglobin is formed. Now, for all the researchers, this was a very interesting and a very important finding because uh, they identified that if by anyhow, we can uh, reverse this process and we can again uh, help this locus control region to bind to the fetal hemoglobin, probably we can induce the fetal hemoglobin and make the patient asymptomatic uh, just as uh, uh, patients with hereditary persistence of fetal hemoglobin. So uh, coming back to the uh, gene therapy, so what are the prerequisites for gene therapy? So it needs a high efficiency gene transfer and high <coughs> HSC engraftment, consistent expression independent of site of integration, high level of expression of gamma and beta globin gene, uh, uh, iteroid lineage specific and developmental stage specific expression of transferred genes. So this is very important. As we know, BCL11A is not only uh, expressed in the in the erythroid precursors it is also expressed in other cell lines so so targeting the bcl 11 a which is specific for erythroid precursors is is very crucial when we are looking at the gene manipulating strategies then safe expression with little or no risk of insertional mutagenesis or oncogenesis so these are the prerequisites for gene therapy and with this uh, the first uh, trial for gene therapy for patients with sickle cell disease so this was uh, this was published in 2018 in new england journal of medicine by Maria Cavazana and uh, group and uh, the case details of this particular patient who was uh, who was presented uh, in any gene paper so it was a boy with homozygous sickle cell disease numerous VOCs two AC uh, acute chest syndrome bilateral osteonecrosis of hip joint <clears throat> so significantly uh, uh, a very symptomatic uh, child he was put on red cell exchange <coughs> in 2010 along with Kalashin and he was enrolled for this particular trial in 2014 at the age of uh, uh, 13 years and this was a bluebird uh, trial uh, uh, BB305 vector encoding trial. Uh, so bone marrow was obtained with the MNC of uh, at two occasions 6.2 and 5.4 into 10 to the power 8. Uh, bone marrow was enriched with CD34 cells. Uh, the patient underwent a myeloablative conditioning using Bucelfan. Uh, after a two days washout period, 5.6 million cells per kg of transcute CD34 and it was a lengthy viral vector mediated transduction. Uh, so it was infused. <coughs> And red cell transfusion was continued to 25 to 30 percent of HP AT, uh, 87Q was detected. So this is sort of an anti-cycling hemoglobin, which which mimics uh, the fetal hemoglobin. Uh, further analysis of this particular trial. So this was a paper published in Ash. So where we can see that the almost 30 patients were recruited and. Uh, till early this year, around 41 patients were recruited in this particular trial. Uh, it was going smoothly, but uh, uh, with with little bit of hiccups. But this trial was halted in on 11th or 12th of uh, February in 2022 because 
uh, around three patients developed myeloid plastic syndrome followed by acute myeloid leukemia. So this trial was halted by Bluebird trial and they are currently investigating the reason uh, for, for, for this clonal evolution to myeloid plastic syndrome or acute myeloid leukemia. And it will say it takes some more time, although it appears that that uh, 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 it's nothing to do with the linked viral vector because the same strategy has been used for the thalassemic cohort in around 50 patients have been recruited in HBB204 and TZO205 trial. And this has not been noticed in the thalassemic cohort. It is, it is only uh, to the uh, sickle cohort and it doesn't appear to be related to the lentiviral, ve uh, lentiviral vector, but still it needs some more investigation before this trial can move further. So <clears throat> there are challenges with viral vector mediated gene therapy and uh, the challenges which I could gather is that we need optimal vector. There is a risk of insertional metagenesis. This is, there is risk of clonal evolution in the long run and there are significant costs incurred in it, it is labor intensive. So this brings in picture the possibility of uh, uh, gene editing. So <clears throat> it's, it's what are the advantages of gene editing and why is it in discussion uh, so much nowadays? So the advantage is it is much safer, it is much precise, and <clears throat> it will be more cost effective as compared to the other vector mediated gene uh, therapy strategies. Uh, what is the basis of gene editing? What is the current status? And what are the uh, any un ongoing trial or upcoming trial? So we'll have a look in the slides, subsequent slides to come. So when we talk about gene editing tools, so these are the three main gene editing tools. So zinc finger nucleases, talens, or CRISPR. We'll not talk about these other two because they are, although Sangmo is still using the zinc finger nucleases, but but uh, it they are quite uh, I mean tedious and 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 there are some challenges. And the easiest is is the CRISPR Cas9 system, which is which is uh, the widely used system nowadays for gene editing uh, strategies. Uh, for various diseases, whether it is adrenal leukodystrophy or, or there are so many papers which have come up in, in NEGM in past two years uh, by using CRISPR-Cas9 to treat various metabolic disorders. So what is CRISPR-Cas9? So uh, how I understand is, so it's, it's, it's sort of a vaccination card which is developed, developed by a bacteriophage uh, 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 against various viruses it is exposed uh, in the uh, in in course of time. So, with each exposure to a virus, to a new virus, it takes up, it cuts and takes a part of the DNA of that particular virus and incorporates into its own DNA. Okay, so that the next time it gets exposed to the virus, it has capacity to slice slice that virus. So, <clears throat> this becomes sort of a immunization card for that bacteriophage, and this is called as clustered regularly interspaced short, short palindromic repeats. So this along with the Cas9, the, the uh, cleavaging system uh, is, is what is being used uh, uh, for the gene editing strategies in, in uh, current trials. So how does the CRISPR-Cas9 work? So basically we need a guide, uh, uh, guide RNA, which is around 15 to 20 base pairs guide RNA. Uh, so guide RNA uh, is, is our uh, uh, RNA of interest whenever we are treating whether it's thalassemia or sickle or we are targeting the BCL11A locus or ZBTA locus, uh, so whatever, or MYB locus, so that decides our guide RNA. So this guide RNA along with the uh, CRISPR-Cas9 system is goes and, and it causes uh, double-stranded breaks. Now, whenever a DNA is breaking, usually that's a that's a normal tendency of the DNA to, to heal, and it can heal by two processes, whether it's a, a homology-directed repair or a NHEJ, which is non-homologous end joining. So these are the two ways. HDR mediated repairs are a little bit complicated. So majority of times, the, the DNA is, uh, uh, they, they just heal themselves by NHEJ uh, mediated repairs. <clears throat> so this is how the uh, CRISPR-Cas9 system works. And uh, 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 based on this particular approach, uh, this, this CRISPR therapeutics proposed to the trial in 2018. And uh, subsequently, um, in, in I think in January this year or December last year, this <coughs> paper was published in NEGM uh, by Farangal, uh, Selim and uh, Josu, Rupert. So, so uh, a number of uh, uh, my transplant colleagues, these know these people so they they have done a, they have made a significant contribution to the field of uh, 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 transplants 
so they published their outcomes of two patients, one with transfusion dependent thalassemia, another one with sickle cell disease, and they targeted the PCL 11A locus by CRISPR Cas9 uh, uh, to, to treat that particular uh, defect. So this was uh, uh, what is happening in the West. Now, if we look at what is happening in India, so uh, uh, as far as my understanding is, there are one or two groups which are actively working into gene editing strategies for, for uh, uh, thalassemia and sickle cell disease. And this is a, uh, a rough outline of what has been done uh, so far. So this is uh, the uh, thalassemia, uh, beta thalassemia major patient or a sickle cell disease patient. The peripheral uh, mobilized stem cells are collected. Uh, then they undergo a purification process. Then CRISPR-Cas9 mediated gene editing is done. Uh, Ex vivo it's the differentiation happens. They undergo further uh, uh, <clears throat> analysis to see flow cytometry, RT-PCR, and uh, uh, other investigations. And finally, uh, what is being intended is to do a uh, animal or in vivo studies. And subsequently, once the robust data is available for in vivo analysis, then uh, human clinical trials can be proposed. So with this, I would like to sum up my session. Uh, with these through four uh, take home messages that sickle cell disease is a preventable disease. And as soon as the diagnosis is made, which is usually in the first year of life, supportive treatment should be initiated as soon as possible. A close observation is required to identify CV phenotypes. Transplant should be offered to these patients, these CV phenotypes, as soon as possible. Uh, and as we make uh, BMT or HSCT more amenable to the masses, we should also prepare ourselves for futuristic modalities such as gene therapy and gene editing. So with this, I would like to conclude my session and thank you all once again for a very patient listening and uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Agrawal and Nemechi for giving me this opportunity to share our work with our fellow colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gaurav. That was wonderful, taking through the saga of your Apollo experience, your work, phenomenal, tremendous, very, very impressive. So we will wait for the uh, faculty to put the raise hand sign. Meanwhile, I'll ask you a question from the audience. Dr. Naresh wants to know what is the maximum age of doing BMT in sickle cell disease? Uh, so if you look at, if you uh, uh, talk about our experience, so our patients included uh, from nine months to 32 years of age, but elsewhere across the globe, people have also included patients as old as uh, 50, 55, 60 years of age. And if you can see the paper, which are presented by our European uh, colleagues, where they analyzed around 1400 patients, so they excluded around uh, uh, 400 patients based on certain parameters and age beyond 50 years was one of them. So in our cohort, it is between nine years to 32 years. But uh, if you personally ask our experience, age is a very crucial factor and uh, uh, our cutoff is 13 years or 15 years uh, uh, beyond which our uh, sort of selection criteria for transplant or uh, the counseling for uh, that particular patient family is, is different because we know that it is going to be a challenging transplant. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ruchira Mishra, your question, please. Um, hi, Gaurav. Yeah. Uh, excellent presentation, Gaurav. Uh, and uh, congratulations on your wonderful cell anemia. It's fantastic. So, a question for you is in your pre transplant. Um, suppressive therapy that you give, do you also give them hypertransfusion to decrease their sickle cell uh, HPS levels to about 30 or less than 30? No. So we don't, uh, 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 we, we don't target the uh, sickle hemoglobin, but yes, we maintain our hypertransfusion so that we maintain their hemoglobin more than 10 to 11. But uh, uh, we have never targeted the sickle hemoglobin and try to keep it <coughs> below 30% mark as, as highlighted in some of the studies. Okay, we'll take another question from the audience. Dr. Raj Barrier wants to know any specifics, uh, any specific information for number and outcome specifically for Indian patients. So, sir, uh, uh, thank you for, for this question. So, that's something which is frustrating for us sir, because out of these 100 patients and now uh, uh, I would put it at 103 as of today. Uh, uh, only uh, I, one patient uh, is, is, is from uh, India. Uh, and we know that although these patients, uh, so Arab Indians, they behave a little bit differently, 
but uh, for uh, my colleagues who have been working uh, with patients we know that in india also we have a significant burden of the disease and very symptomatic patients so i go to raipur in bhopal for for monthly opds and we see a number of patients who are quite symptomatic so this is this is unfortunate sir that uh, out of these 100 or 103 patients just one patient uh, is 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 from india and rest of them are from uh, africa or middle east or other parts of the world thank you varun dr prashant your question yeah follow up of the same question i mean is we know that indian sickle is less severe but some will be severe as you just now said is there any guidance for indian doctors for monitoring organ damage in sickle cell disease with a view to refer them for transplant so uh, as uh, prashant uh, uh, absolutely i mean and and ma'am is here dr deepthi she has she has been working with these uh, patients for so 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 long uh so uh, madam uh, uh, i think would agree with uh, me that uh, this is a real challenge to identify patients who yes. are candidates for transplants and that's why i highlighted the indication the revised list of indications which was used by bolenos in their paper which was for selection of haploidentical family donors not match sibling so obviously when we talk about match sibling donor our criteria becomes more liberal so that was the criteria which they used for sibling to, for for haploidentical family donor transplants so i mean my uh, one liner suggestion would be that we need to keep our uh, eyes and ears uh, uh, open so that we can identify these patients uh and and sort of uh, uh, direct them to transplants as soon as possible because age plays a significant role uh, uh when we look at the overall survival and inventory survivals uh, garo i think uh, you should take a lead role in developing these guidelines since you are sort of leading the sickle cell disease transplants in the country um uh, you should work with the hematologists who are looking after sickle cell patients and develop those guidelines they will be very useful yeah so uh, government of india has come up with the guidelines so i think the first draft includes the guidelines of uh, uh, for various uh, sort of supportive care measures but as you rightly highlighted um, the guidelines for picking or choosing the patients for transplants uh should be added to that particular guideline as a as a addendum and uh, uh although i have not been uh, directly involved but uh, i have been asked for some suggestions but i think uh, ma'am has been involved with, with that particular guideline and uh, uh yes subsequently we should we will propose uh, to the uh, government agencies that a clear cut list of indications should be added to those guidelines so that it becomes easy for our pediatric colleagues to refer to the patients well in time thank you thank you got a one question from the audience again yeah. dr raj barrier has a question did you have difficulty in pre transplant transfusions of the african patients due to allo antibodies and red cell profile <clears throat> yes sir so uh, 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 not uh, very commonly and not uncommonly also so if i would uh, recollect it although i i'll have to look at this data but if i recollect i think we have faced this challenge in around uh, five to seven patients where because of sensitization we had to screen multiple uh, blood products before we can give them uh, suitable transfusion but surprisingly sir uh, this sensitization with respect to the uh, abo uh, compatibility did not uh, uh, affect the uh, uh, transplant outcome so like uh a number of these patients almost 50 60% of these patients who were showing this uh, <coughs> sensitization were haploidentical family donors but uh, they were dsa negative and and uh, uh, we did not face any significant challenge uh, at the time of transplant thank you dr dipti jain yes uh, your talk was very educative for me because none of my patients i see th- thousands of patients but none of them have gone for a transplant ever so it was very educative and especially the lessons you have learned from 100 patients however it is frustrating that only one patient was indian uh, uh, one question is how do you increase the applicability and acceptability in our country for bone marrow transplant and i would say for me i may not include severe voc but at least stroke 
stroke, at least five to seven percent of our patients with stroke have recurrent stroke. It's so morbid. Some acute chest. So I would say out of 100 patients, uh, one patient should go for or one of my patients should have a transplant. Um, how do you see that? Uh, it's possible. Oh, yeah. I think that is what is remaining in our country, you know. We are going for gene therapy. Yes, we have to wait for some time. But then, you know, what are the ways? And I think multi-organ failure is a, a long way. Yes? Uh, yep. uh, detecting multi-organ failure. We are doing screening now. And uh, we have some remedies, treatment for that. Hydroxyurea, new drugs, chronic transfusion. We, we have, for uh, nephropathies, we have few things. Uh, but very tiny population go for this. The other, the biggest problem I see in sickle cell is the prediction of severity. We cannot predict severity, uh, I think, uh, in every patient early. Like, unlike thalassemia major, uh, I may be wrong. I think uh, we go for a transplant, right? But in sickle um, I would say 10 to 20% of my patients are mild. So whom to take for transplant and how do we decide? And what is the youngest age when you can uh, recommend the transplant? So ma'am, uh, there are two or three questions in, in your... Uh, yes, I know. Him. So the first thing is, how can we encourage uh, policymakers? How can we encourage the pediatric colleagues for this particular thing. And I think the one-liner answer is advocacy, advocacy, and advocacy. So we have achieved significant outcomes with respect to advocacy when it comes to thalassemia. But uh, we all will agree that sickle cell disease somehow has, has taken a backseat when this advocacy for sickle for thalassemia has happened. So <clears throat> that's something which uh, with uh, which we need to take forward with, uh, with you being at the forefront when it comes to policy making. Uh, so uh, advocacy to the government, uh, 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 to policymakers is extremely, extremely important. Secondly, ma'am, <clears throat> with respect to the identification of the patients and, and how to pick them early. So this, this is not a problem only with us, ma'am. This was a global challenge. And I think uh, I highlighted that this was one of the main obstacles why sickle cell disease transplant did not pick up uh, as, as it picked up for other, uh, uh, say, thalassemia or for other diseases, severe plastic anemia. So, because pediatricians or the hematologists, they were not clear in the understanding that which patient needs transplant and what's the right age for transplants. But subsequently, if you look at, uh, so again, I, I, I'll share a paper with you by Shalini Shinoy. So they have made serial revisions in their uh, selection criteria for transplants. And uh, this was something which, which I, I found most inclusive, which was proposed by Bolanos. And uh, uh, it, uh, if you look at these uh, features, then quite a number of our patients uh, 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 meet one of these criteria. Secondly, as you highlighted very importantly, ma'am, this disease is full of unpredictability. Full of unpredictability. I have out of these 100 patients or 103 patients, I have at least 20 examples who were doing fine uh, till say five years of age. And then sixth year, their life became miserable, okay? Or, or say X, Y, Z year. And then they have to come for transplant. Then when they came to us for transplant, they had one or uh, other significant organ dysfunction, which, which posed significant challenges and brought our outcomes down. So uh, for us, it's a, as pediatricians, it's a real challenge to identify these patients. I think we need to continuously, uh, 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 closely monitor our patients, keep these criteria in mind, which have been laid down by, by difficult uh, uh, consortiums across the globe. And uh, whenever we feel that with optimal supportive care, hydroxyurea and other stuff, the patient is not doing well, the patients, these patients need to be referred to a center as early as possible because, ma'am, if the patient is transplanted within five to six years of age, believe me, whether it's a family donor or a, a haploidical family donor or a sibling donor, the outcomes are as good as 90 to 95%. If I further chisel down our cohort of these 100 patients in less than five years, outcomes are more than 95%. So uh, age is an extremely, extremely important factor. And uh, for us, it's a real Dr. challenge. Dr. Gaurav, one question. Yes, ma'am. Just one interrupting. You go to Raipur, um, uh, Chhattisgarh, right? Mm -hmm. I think the patients are very severe there. 
very severe. The type of patients are very severe. So, uh, how many could you pick them up for a transplant? So oh, yes, ma'am. So now, because uh, I mean, we started uh, uh, interacting with our colleagues, uh, spreading awareness. Uh, so the the biggest challenge, as I as I faced everywhere, I mean, uh, whether it was Africa or 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 in India, that pediatricians, our fellow pediatricians, were not aware about the advances which have happened, and the biggest deterrent was the success rate. So if if I ask. 10 of my pediatric colleagues there that what do you think is the success rate of transplant, uh, uh, leave aside mad sibling donor or haploantical donor. So they said that uh, as far as we are aware, the outcomes are pretty poor. So that's why we never advocate this. So for them to understand that the advancements have happened and the outcomes are more than 90%, if, if we offer this modality at right point of time, uh, uh, it will make a significant difference. So now we have started getting patients. We have around two, three two patients who are planned for transplants in, in next three to four years from, from Chhattisgarh. Uh, and same holds true for Bhopal. So we have transplanted uh, now two patients from Bhopal uh, 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 and nearby areas. So awareness is uh, increasing. Uh, and uh, I think uh, that's the best way to move forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Dipti. Another question from audience. Dr. Gopinathan wants to know, what's the clinical cutoff for deciding about tocilizumab post-transplant in CRS? Yeah, so this was one paper which uh, we sort of uh, uh, thought of presenting this year in EBMT about our experience of tocilizumab, whether it is for the cytokine release syndrome or it is for the engraftment. So we use it for, uh, uh, for both these indications. So the cutoff is, to be honest, it is not uh, uh, same as the cutoff which has been proposed for other cellular therapy modalities where they use a cutoff of 100, uh, if I remember it correctly. Uh, so I have six levels of 100 and beyond to give tocilizumab. For a number of our patients, we have seen um, outliers where IL-6 has, has been more than 1500, but the patients have been asymptomatic. So we, we do IL-6 levels for all our uh, alternative donor transplants on day four. Huh? Uh, and subsequently, we see that if the symptomatology persists beyond day five, then on day six, we give IL, uh, V6, uh, we give uh, tocilizumab. Okay. So there are outliers, there are patients who are even at a uh, IL-6 of more than 1500 asymptomatic. And there are patients who with a IL-6 level of 40, 50, 60, they are pretty symptomatic and uh, need tocilizumab. So uh, to be honest, uh, we don't have a cutoff as of now, but that's what we are, we are, we are trying to understand that which cutoff we should use for the patient to teach Thank you. Dr. Intaja, your question. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Gaurav, first of all, I would like to congratulate you on a fantastic talk. And uh, I agree with most of the panelists and other people in the uh, uh, presentation today that you should probably take the lead because you have the maximum experience in transplanting these children. My question is very basic. We all understand that sickle cell disease manifestations vary from a milder illness to a very severe disease. Majority of the African population and some of the other, uh, you know, family tribes have a very severe variety. The guidelines for allergenic transplant in sickle cell disease, as you rightly mentioned, uh, used to talk about uh, recurrent stroke and uh, or a history of previous stroke or recurrent acute chest syndrome. Those are not responding to hydroxyurea, recurrent BOC and so on and so forth. Now, we all know that uh, sibling match transplant definitely has excellent cure rates and uh, earlier it is done, it's going to be better because end organ damage is not there. Now, my question is like, if you have a child who is about say 18 to 24 months of age from African descent, with a strong family history of uh, severe sickle cell disease. And currently, this child has had only a couple of vasoclusive crises and does not have any sibling match donor. And the family asks you to do a haploidentical transplant for this child. Would you do a haplo transplant for this child in this scenario? So you said that there is a strong family history of African descent with limited yes. access, I, I assume with a limited access to care and the age is less than five years. With uh, VOCs, does the VOC meet the standard criteria of more than three VOCs a year for two consecutive years? 
So if that is the case, so if you look at the indications, uh, Dr. Uh, in, uh, in the Bolanos paper, so I mean, the first CBC, if your hematocrit is less than 20%, if there's basophilic stippling, so a number of factors which we usually do not consider uh, uh, while deciding about the transplant. So if we look at those criteria as well, and if you have such a patient, I'm sure he'll meet one of the criteria. And to be honest, uh, uh, I'll consider this patient for transplant uh, if he meets this criteria of three VOCs a year, uh, even if for just one year, not two consecutive years. Because uh, by uh, this much of experience, we know that if we can intervene early, the outcomes are going to be phenomenal at this age. So, would you advise hydroxyurea therapy trial for this child? And if the child does not respond, yeah, 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 absolutely. So, a fair trial of hydroxyurea has to be given. So, all and what if the family tells that they don't want to go for hydroxyurea trial and they want to go for uh, aplo transplant right away, even so after extensive counseling? Okay. I think this becomes a very tricky question and, and no one uh, uh, will be able to give a clear cut guideline. I think in such scenarios, you have to have a very robust discussion with the family, discussing both the pros and cons. We need to understand their side of the story as well. I mean, they might have had another child who, whom they might have lost a, a year or two back. Okay. And that's why they are so much concerned that, okay, we don't want, and that, that might have been the first episode. I've seen so many cases where just the first episode has been a life-threatening episode for that particular child. So if that is the concern, if that is the reason, their concerns are very, very genuine and we need to have a candid discussion with them. And if, uh, if, if, if they uh, accept the pros and cons, then uh, uh, it can be considered. Thanks, Dr. Gaurav. That answers the question because you remember I had called you for this yes, case absolutely. and we had a scenario like this uh, uh, two years ago, that's why I asked this question. No, I, I, I agree with it because because look, it's not it's not a very sort of a clear. It's a gray area, and and you can't understand the anxiety which these families go through. I mean, losing one or we have seen families where out of four kids they have lost two or three kids in succession. So the fourth child they want to save at any cost, and and even if the child does not have any symptoms, so we need to understand their side of the story as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Inteja, we take another question from the audience. Dr. Gopinathan now has a question. How much BK virus reactivation do you see in your haplo cohort? What's your plan of management? So, yeah, BK virus, if I see, if I, um, uh, if <clears throat> you remember that slide, so out of uh, these 25 patients, uh, BK virus was seen in three patients. Now, <clears throat> off late, what has happened, we are just trying to figure out that in past three to four months, the rate of our BK infections has gone down significantly, and we haven't made any difference in the, in the conditioning. The only difference which we have made is because of the shortage of thymoglobin, uh, which we were using earlier, we have started using uh, uh, graphalon, but uh, I don't think that might be the sole factor, but uh, off late, we have started getting, seeing uh, BK virus, not only in haploantical transplants, but also in our mad sibling donor transplants for thalassemia or, or, or for sickle cell disease or aplastic anemia. As far as the management strategy is concerned, so the, uh, it depends on, on the symptomatology. The first thing is, is just to, uh, so first thing is we do not uh, do regular monitoring. So we <clears throat> do monitoring at the first indication of uh, evidence of uh, uh, of BK induced manifestations, hemorrhagic cystitis. Okay, uh, and if the levels are high, then we treat it. However, uh, uh, and when we talk about the treatment strategy, I think it is pretty clear: hyperhydration, uh, uh, and uh, if the levels are beyond a certain range, then we give uh, cidofovir preemptively, even if there are no, I mean, uh, hemorrhagic manifestations. Also, thank you, Dr. Abhilasha. Your question. Uh, unmute yourself. So, um, excellent talk, Dr. Gaurav. Uh, so, two patients have been reported to have developed AML post uh, lentiglobin gene therapy. So, my question is is it uh, due to the insertional mutagenesis or conditioning chemotherapy which is responsible for this AML? I think, uh, I think Dr. Abhinasha, there, there a lot needs to be understood about this particular thing. So if you 
if we look at our patients out of these 103 patients which we have treated two of our patients have also developed acute myeloid leukemia within 3 years of undergoing a haploidental transplants whereas we have hardly seen a patient who has undergone uh, who has developed such clonal evolution after the thalassemia transplant. Then the same holds true between these two HBB204, T05 and this particular sickle cell uh, gene therapy trial. So I think it's not only about the lentivirus, it's also about the susceptibility of, uh, of sickle cell disease um, for these clonal evolution and, and the prior treatment which they have been exposed to, uh, uh, of which hydroxyurea is the commonest one. So it would be, it would not be correct or appropriate to say that it was because of the insertional mutagenesis. I think uh, it is uh, partly because of the nature of the disease. And uh, subsequently, as, as we get uh, a more detailed analysis of Bluebird BioTrial, we'll get to know more about the reasons for the same. Thank you, Dr. Bhar. Thank you, Dr. Abhilasha. Another question from Dr. Raj Varier is, should you screen all donors with whole genome sequencing to be sure that they, they do not have a bad mutation? So, so, sir, all the donors, we do not do whole, whole uh, uh, genome sequencing. So we screen all our donors with uh, uh, HPLC. Uh, uh, and if uh, the HPLC is suggestive of AS uh, uh, or AA, we consider them as donor. But uh, as a routine, we do not screen, we do not do a whole exome, whole genome sequencing to look for uh, uh, the underlying mutation. Uh, it has it is it has really been documented, sir. Rather, to be honest, I haven't encountered a case where uh, uh, on HPLC uh, the patient had presentation of a, of sort of a carrier or a trait and had significant uh, uh, sort of clinical complications. And subsequently, a whole genome sequencing was done and identified as a mutation, a, a significant contributing mutation. So that's not a norm, sir, and, and we don't uh, practice it. We just uh, choose our donor based on HPLC. Thank you, Dr. Shruti. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Gaurav, for all the experience that you have shared with us. It was really enlightening and educative, as Dr. Deepthi said. Um, I, I don't I don't see a lot of sickle because it's not very common up north. But, you know, from whatever cases we have seen, they're very unpredictable. And as you said, you know, even one episode or the very first episode can, you know, cost the life of the patient. So, you know, would you recommend doing an HLA typing right up front when the diagnosis of HLA is made and if a HLA uh, match sibling is available so that, you know, because the families also need time to discuss and, uh, you know, make up their mind. So I think somewhere uh, a lesson should go that uh, an HLA typing should be done at baseline uh, between the child and siblings. And probably if, you know, like for thal transplants, the government initiatives come in probably the acceptability of transplant would improve. Uh, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? I totally agree with what you're saying, uh, uh, Shruti. So uh, basically, as far as the HLA typing is concerned, I think uh, uh, the way uh, uh, me and my other uh, uh, transplant colleagues have been doing uh, aggressively for thalassemia, that uh, uh, right at the time of diagnosis, there are various uh, support uh, system from the NGOs which are doing free thalassemia screening camps. So this should be extended further for, for our sickle cohort as well so that uh, we at least have the background information that yes, in case the need arises, uh, we have the uh, understanding of whether we have a donor in the family or we have a donor in the unrelated donor registry. Okay. Uh, and, and if subsequently the need arises, the, the transplant can be initiated without wasting any time further. Government policy and the involvement is extremely important. Yes, and that's what I have been highlighting that advocacy is, is, is very important. Uh, and uh, I think we should be the torch bearers for, for this advocacy because um, uh, government is totally clueless about this thing. And until they have, they have uh, 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 proper guidance about what needs to be done, it is very difficult for them. So uh, I think uh, a proposition can be made from from, from uh, sort of a consortium kind of a thing to comment of India or Ministry of Health and Family Welfare or Ministry of Tribal Affairs, uh, uh, which deals with uh, areas uh, where the sickle cell burden is quite high. 
uh, that uh, these initiatives should at least be taken up in high risk areas if not in the entire country thank you dr shruti another question from audience dr sandeep wants to know any experience with alpha beta depletion strategy yes so uh, out of these 100 patients one of our patient was tcr alpha beta depleted um, and the reason being that this child was partially sensitized uh, and the dsa level was around i think 7000 or 8000 uh, haploidical family donor uh, uh, we tried desensitization uh, by our routine measures uh, we desensitized this child and then we thought of giving uh using this tcr alpha beta approach so that and that was a time when we were not using perixifer so we thought of using this strategy so that we can give a mega dose of cd34 cells so this child engrafted showed good results uh, but uh, i think uh, roughly around day 30 35 post transplant uh, he became cytopenic and and, and uh, had a secondary graft failure so just one patient out of these 103 patients and and that was one of our uh, rejection so he's he's alive with the uh, sickle cell disease and uh, so far uh, they haven't opted for a second transplant but yes they are in the process of the same thank you dr harsha congratulations gauru uh, it was a wonderful presentation um, so part of my question is already answered by you dr wari asked about indian scenario the question what i wanted to know uh, answer um, uh, is couple of my patients who are not getting admitted with the uh, sickle crisis but their quality of life is poor in terms of uh, absence from the school days or presentations to the local pediatricians or to us um, quite often so would you recommend um, um, for transplant for those kids whose quality of life is poor Hashan, on hydroxyurea exactly so hi again this is this is a very Uh, uh, this is this is a myriad of uh, uh, clinical manifest so we never look at the psychological aspect of this disease i mean uh, being busy with our with our day to day work we are more geared up looking at the uh, absolute clinical manifestations venoclusive crisis acute chest syndrome but what the patient goes through with respect to yeah. venoclusive crisis i mean the, the the it is such a a uh, variable presentation I mean, one child might uh, uh, not complain about it having severe manifestations on the other hand other child might report it even with minor manifestations okay and uh, uh, their uh, pain tolerance is also quite significant so i i say these are sort of uh, echoes of the disease okay they are not the direct manifestations of the disease but they are the echoes of the disease and Uh, as a pediatrician we need to take these also into consideration while making any particular uh, uh, decision so one of our my haploidical cohort i mean you wouldn't imagine as you rightly said significant very symptomatic i mean frequent transfusions and so depressed that she was not even communicating with her with her siblings okay hardly out of a month she used to go to school for 3 to 4 days okay now uh, uh, she came to us at around uh, 13 14 years of age with such severe manifestations school absenteeism uh, severely depressed on fluoxetine now what to do she did not have any sibling uh, out of four siblings real siblings so we opted for a haploidical transplant and this girl I, i mean i would love to show her picture she's 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 turned into a beautiful young lady doing her master somewhere in china so and just it is not about the disease it is not about the child we treat it is about the entire family we treat okay because just imagine the the pain and agony which this family goes through each day as because it's full of unpredictable you know know what is going to happen the next day so uh, you you very appropriately mentioned these echoes of the disease should also be kept into consideration when we make any clinical decision thank you thank you thank you thank you harsha uh, another question from the audience uh, amit khurana to make it short 11 year old boy having multiple thromboembolic episodes fat embolism causing bone marrow necrosis pulmonary thromboembolism hemorrhagic infarcts in the brain survived all this now is he a suitable candidate for transplant absolutely i mean what else uh, i mean you don't have a gene therapy so so if not this child then whom else we offer transplant but yes the question the big question will be 
that uh, do we have a sibling donor or not and he will need a very very meticulous planning and a thorough counseling look we know uh, dr amit that if you don't offer transplant to this child the next uh, uh, serious complication he might have he might not come out of it it is just uh, 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 god's grace that he's he's out of all those complications but that doesn't mean that he'll come out of all such compl complications which he goes through in future so this is the time uh, and and the thorough counseling needs to be done with the family that look the outcomes will not be as good as other patients because of the significant organ damage but yes this is the only way to cure him thank you dr amit thank you sir for the excellent presentation and data so sir my doubt is uh, sir have you noticed uh, any long term transplant complications or sequelae in patients who had a history of stroke and uh, sir if i am not mistaken in your haplopaper the mother was donor in most of the patients so uh, was it selected deliberately or male donors were unfit for the transplant mm -hmm. so yeah so basically long term uh, uh, sequelae of of uh, uh, especially the stroke i'll not say only stroke a long term sequelae of the disease so that's something which is challenging because we have very we have seen it not as often as our european colleagues that these patients continue to have these veno occlusive crisis kind of pains even 2 to 3 years post transplant okay so this is the commonest manifestation or sequelae post transplant okay but this is not related to the uh, this is more related to the psychological uh, issues rather than actual uh, uh, pathology so this is one thing another thing uh, with respect to the stroke so uh, sequelae yes they are at high risk of having a seizure uh, uh, and that is why we put these patients on prophylactic anti epileptics till at least day 180 and if there is a history of stroke obviously they continue to be on long term uh, uh, anti epileptic strategies uh, subsequently if if they pass one year then uh, and there is no further damage to the brain as as we expect after the transplant then the recovery is pretty good depends on at what age the transplant has been done and what is the recovery potential uh, of that particular child uh, i i would have loved to share there is a there is a, uh, a video on my uh, on my twitter i posted long back of a 14 15 year old girl who underwent transplant at the uh, when she had right sided hemiparesis and she was playing in her volleyball uh, in in her uh, courtyard uh, so full of life so so yes uh, 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 if if one year post transplant can pass without any challenges then subsequently uh, recovery is expected it depends what is the extent of serious damage which will decide that how much recovery can we expect okay. and and obviously the interventions which we do so aggressive rehabilitation post transplant okay <clears throat> okay uh is one question whether it's relevant to you or not i do not know dr anil singh we wants to know transplantation in patients of myelofibrosis having cytopenia i think uh, one of my other colleague might be able so yes i think myelofibrosis uh, as, as we know if if you have a sibling donor and depends on what is the age of the patient what uh, what are the other comorbidities so uh, uh, if if we have a sibling donor and a patient has a good performance status then transplant should be offered okay so those were the last couple questions from the colleagues here and the audience i have some questions doctor uh i want to know the long term survival and the quality of life of these patients when i was doing residency in hematology the first patient of sickle cell disease was a black transplanted in belgium for acute myeloblastic leukemia and he got cured of his sickle cell disease and that was the beginning of transplant for sickle cell disease it took time for this treatment to take off and then uh, we have our colleagues from mumbai who are now working in middle east country and they have experience of thousands of patients transplanted with excellent results uh, i want to ask overall from your experience and from the literature uh, what has been the median survival and what has been the quality of life for those years so sir we we presented a a short review i, I think in 2018 in epmt it was an abstract um, looking at the various uh, uh, sickle cell uh, morbidity index so there is a morbid sickle cell morbidity index which we compared uh, pre transplant and post transplant 
uh, for patients uh, who who underwent uh, uh, transplant for sickle cell disease and uh, I can share it with you or, or other people who are interested. So there was a significant improvement in various parameters, whether it was with respect to the child or it was with respect to the family pre and post transplant. So uh, quality of life, undoubtedly, sir, it's, it's, it's way, 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 way better after transplant. And uh, as I say, always say that these chronic disease uh, have their cause of the disease where it covers the entire family. So it's not only about the, the quality of life of that particular child, it is about the quality of life of the entire family, which, which improves significantly. I, I, I often uh, get patients that I remember a family uh, whom I transplanted and I met around uh, two years post-transplant and uh, we were at a sort of a, uh, uh, <clears throat> just a small social get together. And they say that Dr. Kaurav, you don't, you can't even realize that this was sort of unimaginable for us uh, before transplant. And uh, for 10 years uh, uh, prior to transplant, we never thought of uh, uh, any vacation because it was full of unpredictability. So, okay. So morbidity is negligible in short. What has been the <coughs> survival pattern? Do they live for a normal lifespan or what do they put it exactly. as? So sir, long-term follow-up, obviously we need to continue. But if you see our longest follow-up is around 2,826 days. So, so which is close to around uh, uh, seven, seven and a half years post-transplant. And uh, we, we would like to maintain this follow-up in years to come. Literature-wise? Uh, sorry? Literature-wise? Literature-wise, sir, uh, uh, the earliest transplant for sickle cell disease, as you also highlighted, happened in 1996. So the largest uh, uh, series or, or largest, uh, uh, longest data we have is for around 25 years only. And if you see from that time also, majority of transplants have happened in last 10 years only. So I think we'll have to wait for more time to see uh, 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 long-term data. But uh, as far as the five-year data is concerned, which we consider as, as pretty significant, it is, it is very encouraging. So there is no time-related mortality, right? Whatever 10, 15, 20 years. No, yeah. whatever has to happen, sir, because of the transplant-related complications, whether it is chronic GVHD or or clonal, clonal evolution in some forms, that's that's an exception. But whatever has to happen transplant related will happen in one initial two years. And subsequently, it will be, uh, the, the quality of life will definitely be better. How will they will be at risk of other sickle related complications because majority of them uh, have autosplenectomy uh, prior to transplant. So, so they will be at high risk of infections different from their other peer groups. That's fair. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Dipti, are you there? The same day. Uh, I, I have a question for you. You see thousands yes. of patients. What is the median age of your patients in 2021? Okay. Um, First of all, are you doing only pictures? Yeah. You also it do It's just a very precise answer. Yes. It's just an observation which I think. Yeah. Um, I think uh, late second decade to early third decade. Is the median... Age. Yes, I would say. And you Still, see, we are much lower. Yeah, yeah, much you, lower. Than you me. do both adult and pediatrics, right? Yes, they because my your children become adults. Yes. So, so Gaurav, I wanted to drive this point home. Uh, in my era, there were no pediatric hematologists. So I have I've been trained and sort of worked for pediatric and adults. The number of patients we saw in pediatric is about 100 times more than we see in the adult practice. Absolutely, sir. Yes. Our patients beyond 30 years can be counted on fingertips in 2021 in Mumbai. Exactly. Those who come from all over and patients come to Mumbai only if they have problems. Otherwise, they don't come. We don't have a big indigenous population of sickle cell disease. This one single factor that there are no major adults with sickle cell disease lying around. And Dr. Dipti, this statement that late second and early third decade, tells you that you are shortening the life of these sicklers by 50 years plus. Absolutely. Not sir. offering a curative treatment. Absolutely. Number two, 50% of them are females, right? Now, they don't get married. If they get married, they have serious complications with respect to pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And number of them get divorced. A number of them die during pregnancy or postpartum. And this has been a large number of patients transferred at last minute to places where we work 
because of something which was being managed by the physician or the gynecologist, and then they couldn't handle it anymore. Now with this kind of you know social stigma, uh, girl remaining unmarried, and then pregnancy, and then the pregnancy related issues, then the pregnancy related mortality is phenomenal. So that's another reason why they should be transplanted. I'm not sure whether fertility rate is uh, okay with transplants or not, that Gaurav can answer from his experience or literature, but that's another very, very major reason. And third, again, being in adult practice, sudden death of a person who was doing extremely well. I mean, I have not gone into the scoring system to calculate your transplant indication, but somebody who was, you know, just walking in two, three times in a year for routine follow-up, and then at the age of 30, 35, sudden death. And then I have reviewed this sudden death in sickle cell disease. It's it's difficult to prevent this. Absolutely, sir. It's such a complication that the family is aghast. Somebody has just finished his education, just got married, has got a small kid, is now well placed in the society, and he dies. So Shantanu has been doing you know little transplants in sicklers in Mumbai. Unfortunately, is not there here today. So you know these patients of sickle cell disease. And when we say benign, 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 uh, you don't see them after the third decade of life. Absolutely. So that itself, I think, makes a huge indication that, you know, your calculations apart, social factors and this shortening of the lifespan. And what about the expenses? I just now had a patient who was 35 years old, got admitted in ICU with multi-organ failure. We saved him. He was there for two months in a private hospital. His bill was 70 lakhs. He, he survived because of his luck. We told the family that it's all over. Just leave it. But from a very vegetative shape, he survived. He walked home. But what a bill. Absolutely. So, you know, there are so many factors which you don't read in the textbook. What is yeah. in the practice? So, uh, uh, Dipti has something to add. So, I think actually, I, I just wanted to ask you, Dr. Gaurav, are mm -hmm. you talking about the TWIL scoring system which you have used for morbidity? No, ma'am. It was, it was, uh, it is, uh, I don't uh, know the name exactly. It is called an SCDI, uh, sickle cell disease uh, morbidity index score. So, uh, I can, I can share it with uh, okay. you. Okay. Uh, I can know. Yeah, I need that. Yeah. So the other thing I want to tell is that not that I was sitting quietly with my patients who were very severe. I did send them to places, uh, specifically on those days to Velour. The patients are so underprivileged that I think tip of iceberg is reaching to Mumbai or where. And in as of now in Nagpur, we do not have near Nagpur. Uh, Center for sickle, uh, Transplant for Sickle Cell Disease or Thalassemia. I think, uh, the, Gaurav, you have such huge experience. You can come out with satellite centers here because, you know, traveling patients, if we want to make it uh, available to them, only paying from there uh, will not work. Absolutely. It has to be available nearby. Not, so, they can't travel. They are afraid. Mumbai, jau, Bombay, Delhi, jau, so. we, so, ma'am, uh, what you're saying is absolutely right, ma'am. I think these, they, we as uh, uh, pediatricians, we uh, as community also hold some responsibility. And, and I feel that when patients can travel from, uh, say, 6,000 miles or 10,000 miles for, for such a curative intent, and that too from a country, from areas where, which we consider as uh, more underprivileged or unprivileged than ours, the so African continent, then are patients not reaching out to us at a distance of 600, 700 kilometers is, is, is something which is uh, very disappointing. So I think uh, with respect to this particular thing, what I have realized, the problems are the apprehension, the, 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 the fear of uh, moving out from the places. They have never moved out from their uh, 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 sort of comfort zone. And uh, more importantly, yes. a holding hand, a holding hand which is required. Someone who can confidently tell them that, no, you make this beginning and we'll help you out. Ma'am, transplant scenario has changed for thalassemia. And it is all because of 
uh, all the sustained and continued efforts done by a number of people uh, working in the field of transplants and thalassemia. And it's a shame on us, ma'am. Sickle cell disease, if you look at the border, yes. if you look I, at the morbidity, the morbidity, yes, I agree with you, much, yes. The morbidity is much, much more than, yes. than thalassemia. And still, this is sort the of thalassemia. a kind of a disease. So this is high time. We need to uh, gear up ourselves. We need to uh, poke uh, the policymakers again and again. This is that this is high time, and uh, please, uh, uh, we need to uh, uh, to take this disease seriously and run our strategies, whether it is financial strategies or support strategies accordingly. Gaurav, well, once again, there is a socio-economic uh, difference when we compare thalassemia with sickle cell disease. Yes, sir. Across the world, thalassemics are patients from a better class and a better society. So you see Italians and the Greeks and the Mediterraneans and the Arabians and Thai patients, etc., etc. Sickle, even if they're in the US, they're underprivileged. So that's a huge socioeconomic difference. I mean, ash makes a lot of noise for sickle cell disease people, but when it comes to doing things, there is a huge difference. Second is thalassemia. When they're transfusion dependent, it is a daily problem for them. Sickle is an episodic problem. So unless a pediatrician realizes the consequences in long term, the parents are not convinced because they just see episodic problem. They will chalta hai, will do. It will go on. Till, till it finally ends the story. It just ends. And then they ask, what happened? Why did he die? So education at the level of pediatricians. See, what happens is you are doing sickle cell disease practice, you know, in and out the whole subject. But you look at those 20,000 pediatricians across the country. True, sir. Very true. For them, it's a rare disease. So their education of this is whatever, one, two, three. Either a rare disease or a frustrating disease, sir. I mean, when I started interacting with the pediatric, with my fellow pediatricians in Raipur and Chhattisgarh, I mean, they just, uh, uh, and I remember from my personal experience, when I was doing my graduation from, from Jabalpur, there used to be a separate sickle ward. Our center was next to ICMR and there used to be a separate sickle ward. Sir, me and my colleagues, 100 students from MBBS, we tried to avoid that particular ward to best possible extent because there was nothing constructed which we were constructive which we were offering there. I mean... You see the pain and suffering, and there is very little you can offer. So uh, by default, we were ignoring that area. And that's that's the general perception across all our fellow physicians or pediatricians. So I think the scenario has changed because now there is something which can be offered as a, as a cure, and they need to be made aware, and, and the confidence needs to be built up. Then only they can pass it on to the patients. And even on the side of prevention, if you see, so much is being talked and done for thalassemia. Yeah. Talk about, who talks about prevention of sickle cell disease? Exactly. exactly. So terrible. Uh, anyway, uh, anybody has, has any question? Okay. So then, Gaurav, I think on behalf of everybody, I thank you. And we have uh, Kayur here for the official vote of thanks. Thank you so thank much. Thank you sir. so much, sir, uh, for a great presentation. It is always uh, uh, a best experience to listen your uh, your 100 patients uh, clinical trial and uh, it is like as a master of uh, sickle cell disease now dr gaurav kharia so anywhere and everywhere anyone has a query that dr gaurav kharia can answer that query and 25th evening this many doctors are attending uh, it is one of the great <laughs> great pride <laughs> second thing sir uh, I, I want to thank you also, sir, for, for taking your time out uh, for the scientific uh, meeting. And uh, last but not the least, because there is a forum I need to inform. Uh, for January 2022, starting from the new year, for one month, Cedopovid would not be available because uh, it is under the approval process of DCGI license renew process. So Cedopovid would be available from... February 22 onwards. So one month there would not be a stock. Means I don't have stock for We will not have the stock. So we just talked about yes. BK and increasing incidence of BK. Yeah, you're just uh, uh, putting a bomb on us. I mean, so, so it is my duty to inform clinicians. Sir. We are sorry for that, but we are making as soon as possible. We will make it available again for Indian patients. Sir. 
very soon. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to associate with these groups, sir. Thank you so much, sir, from him, sir. Thank you, Kail. Uh, before we close, I wanted to make two more remarks which I forgot to say. Your uh, patients, the black patients whom you have transplanted, are from Africa, not from US, right? Africa. Yes. Uh, two or three from US, sir. Mostly from US. No, no, no. Two or three from US, majority from Africa. Majority from Africa. You know, Dr. Varier asked a question about allosensitization. Allosensitization is a problem not of African blacks, but of the American blacks because they are transfused with the white blood. Okay. The donors are all white and uh, blacks are the recipient and therefore they get highly allosensitized. Okay, yes, That's yes. why you will not probably face that huge problem that the guys in America face. And second about this, you know, the, the WGS, uh, what he asked, uh, screening of the donor by sequencing. Yes, sequencing. Yes. Uh, sickle cell trait can have almost 20 medical problems, but the average survival, median lifespan of a sickle cell trait is normal. There is not even one month difference between the lifespan of a sickle cell trait and a normal person. This is irrespective of what type of uh, genome they may carry. So it's not really clinically very relevant. They may get problems. They can get kidney problem, they can get this problem, that problem, but it's a little bit of morbidity. Their lifespan is not shortened. So one doesn't have to bother about what kind of genetics they're carrying. So those were the two remarks I had, which I forgot to mention. Anyway, so that's it. Gaurav, once again, extremely so grateful to you for sharing your experience. I think this is the first time, at least in our forum, we have had a talk on sickle cell transplants, and this should, should uh, be a game changer. Let us hope for the best. Thank you, sir. And thank you, Kevin, for support. All a very Merry Christmas, and then thanks for sparing your time. Merry Christmas to everybody. Yes. Bye-bye.